Okay. Good evening, everyone. Today's shiur is called Creation, a World of Chaos, and it is a continuation of last week. We outlined last week that God created the world and he saw that it was exceedingly good, yet we find that in the onset, immediately after creation, Adam and Hava sinned, Cain killed Hevel, Enosh and his uh, ilks, his generation, began to distance themselves from God, made God too abstract. God became an abstract and distant thing, and thus they began to introduce mediums, and then the world became more and more corrupt, as we out- outlined last week. What's the point of all of this? God who created the world, knows everything, uh, surely knew that uh, the world would become corrupt. What's the point of all of this, and where do you find the redeeming quality in all of this? So we learned last week that indeed, the world is inherently good, has redeeming quality, and the fact that man errs and stumbles, nonetheless, and despite that, still able to reach the redeeming quality. And then we outlined that what was the cause of all of this? The blurring of good and evil. When good and evil converge, and you lack clarity of good and evil, and that is the biggest problem. And then what ends up happening is that when they ate the tree of knowledge of good and bad, they began to feel a closeness and an affinity and a relationship with the material world as beforehand their eyes were open to spirituality and closed to the material world. The material world did not attract them at all. Whereas when they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and bad, their eyes opened to materialism but closed towards spirituality. How do we overcome that? The answer to that is accessing the essence of the soul, the part of the soul that is not enclosed in the body, the part of the soul that is pristine, of which we know that there are five parts of the soul, three that are enclosed within the body, and two that encompass the highest of the two, the fifth level, the highest level, which corresponds to the fifth, five um, prayers of Yom Kippur, incidentally, by the way. And that's why the Ne'ilah is the highest one. We open the Echal. It's as if we are, we are now closed within the chamber of God, just us and God, so to speak, refers to the very essence of the soul. When we access the very essence of the soul, there is no question. There are no doubts. And there you find the power and the strength of the soul that is able to overcome all challenges of this physical world. It's interesting to note that one of the names of that part of the soul, which is called Yahida, is also called Etan. Etan in Hebrew means strong, strength. That's where we get our, derive our strength. That's why when Moshe Rabbeinu sought to uh, ask God for forgiveness for the great error that the Jewish people erred in the sin of the golden calf, what did he say? What was his argument? Ki am for they are stiff-necked people. Now, I'll be honest with you, if someone was going to ask me to forgive someone, I'd say, look, please forgive him. He's (laughs) stiff-necked. Stiff-necked means stubborn. Stubborn as a mule. The last thing I would want to do is forgive a stubborn person. Learn humility. Learn how not to be stubborn. Learn how to get along with others. And maybe we can forgive you. Maybe we can move on. But to come along and ask me, look, please forgive so-and-so. He did a terrible thing. What can you do? He's (laughs) stiff-necked. Stiff-necked. Break his neck. Whack his neck. <laughs> Yet Moshe Rabenu goes to God and pleads for forgiveness. And he says, Ki They are stiff-necked people. What was he saying? He was saying that the essence of the soul is strong. And nothing can convince it. Nothing can remove it from its closeness to God. We just need to access that part of the soul. And when you access that part of the soul, you reverse the whole order of things. You begin to open your eyes to spirituality and close your eyes to the coarseness of materialism. So now we will now continuing along, continuing along now. Everything that we discussed about 
does not contradict the intrinsic principle, and that is that the world is inherently good and has a tachlit atov, has, has an end result that will end in good. The potential to find good and reach this good that God implanted in creation despite all of the chaos. As we know, as we've explained, that God is the essence of good, and God's desire is to do good, and when He does good, He seeks to do it in the best possible manner. And that is twofold. To give Himself, which is the essence of, 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 of good, because every revelation is only a reflection of God. The highest worlds, we discussed this once. The highest worlds, the highest revelation is just that. It's a revelation. It's a reflection of a spark of divinity. It is only in this world where we have to strive and toil and we have free choice. And then when we exercise our free choice properly and choose to do good and find good, it is only then that we find God, God Himself. Through the Torah, through the commandments. In high worlds, there's no commandments. In Garden of Eden, there's no commandments. Only in this world there are commandments. Why? Despite the fact that this is the lowest possible world, but in a way it has a redeeming quality that is even higher than all other worlds. Because this is the ultimate goal and desire of God that there should be this physical world. And therefore He gave commandments in this physical world. And therefore a commandment of God is God Himself. When we fulfill the command, we are embracing God Himself. We discussed it, and I'm not going to elaborate on it because we discussed it in other times, but just to remind us, to refresh our memory. And therefore, that is the essence of all good. When we embrace a mitzvah, it's God Himself. It's the essence of all good. It's not just a good feeling, a spiritual feeling, because anyone that comes along and says, you know, uh, 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 seek spirituality. Uh, like, like other religions, for example, that speak a lot about spirituality, but not about practice, not about virtue and practice, just about spirituality, in my opinion, is a bit of an ego trip. Because ultimately, what are you looking for? Something that makes you feel good. So take marijuana, it'll also make you feel good. Or the take a zaza and, <laughs> and it make you feel good for five seconds. It's a spiritual, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a spiritual trip. It's a bit of an ego trip. However much you want to argue that you are transcending self, you are not transcending self. Because you are seeking a spiritual delight or a spiritual experience. Any spiritual experience that is devoid of of a command from God, a mitzvah from God, is not divine. It could be good, it could be spiritual, it could be an expression of your love of God, your awe of God, whatever you want to say. And maybe you have. But true godliness is to be found in His commandments. And those commandments can only be fulfilled in this physical world. Because God, when He sought to give good in this world, He gave the best good, not a reflection in, in Garden of Eden, you enjoy, you bask in the revelation of godliness. When a prophet had a prophecy, he was, his whole body was suspended from the materialism of the world. And he experienced an unbelievable spiritual revelation. But that cannot compare to one solitary moment of a mitzvah that is God himself. That is not just a reflection or a revelation of God. That's A. And B, in order to give of his kindness... And to give the essence of His kindness, it's to be achieved on our own. For if it is given without the ability, without giving, enabling us to have the ability to earn it, then it is what the Kabbalists called Nahama de Chesufa, the bread of shame. God enables us to feel that we are partners in His creation and that we can do something in this world and achieve something and bring the world to perfection and earn that kindness. That in itself is a great kindness. As the Talmud says, that a person prefers one measure that he earns than nine measures given to him. Nine measures, nine times what he earns. Why is that? Because you maintain your dignity. It's very important to maintain your dignity. 
your sense of self-value and worth. When you bring up a child, you don't want the child to be continually dependent upon you. You want them to reach their independence. That's the greatest gift that you can give them. Any parent that allows the child to continually feel dependent upon them is not truly loving the child, is loving themselves. And we do find that a little bit in parents where they don't know how to let go. And when they want the, the children to, otherwise they feel inadequate. What am I living for? What do I? No, that's not true giving. It's like what we said before about the spiritual trip. That's not true spirituality. There are those that seek a, a bliss in one way and there are those that seek bliss in another way. I prefer those that seek bliss in the spiritual pursuit, that, that for sure. But still, it's a certain sense of self. It's not absolute and true transcendence. When is the absolute and true transcendence? When you serve God. And that is when you achieve the greatest gift, that is unity with God. That is inherent in this world. That is the gift that God gave to this world. But together with that is the possibility, unfortunately, a free choice to corrupt. And that certainly happened. And that's why the essence and the, the essence of good remains and does not get, become nullified or, 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 or um, cancelled by errors and sins. They just need to be rectified and fixed. And as we mentioned very briefly last week, that sins are not an intrinsic existence. They don't have an independence upon themselves. And all you have to do is regret it and you remove at least, at least the majority, if not all. Whereas good remains forever. And one good is built upon the other good of our previous generations until the world will come to its fruition and its completeness, its tikkun, its rectification, which is ultimate good that God created in the world. Let's continue now. Ve'aonashim akashim she'enish ha'kadosh baruch v'tadorot ha'rishonim and the punishments that previous generations experienced. Gam heme ha'avim ha'chana the tehilat ha'tikun. They too are part and parcel of the process of bringing the world to tikkun, to rectification. Shaonshim elu shavru et tokef arav im tikuhu. The nature of punishment is not to punish, but rather to cleanse and also to break the source of evil, the strength of evil. We know that when a person experiences difficulties in life, what, is, what does it do to them? It humbles them. When everything is going good for a person, you think that that's when the time that the person is going to be most thankful to God, wouldn't you? But we find in the Torah the exact opposite. Shamanta avita chasita. Vaishmani shurun vaivaat. God warned the Jewish people, you will come into the land and I will bless the land. The land is filled with milk and honey. It's a beautiful land. Great qualities. And you will become, you will be fruitful, you will multiply and you will be blessed and you will become enriched. But be warned, with wealth comes arrogance. You think that they would be most thankful? No. Shamanta, avita, kasita, vaishman, ishurun, vaivat, vaishman, Jew, the Jewish people waxed uh, uh, fat, so to speak, vaivat, and they rebelled against God. Someone one time asked me, why do we make birkat amazon after we eat? We ate, we just were tired now, you know what I mean? You should just make birkat amazon before. To be sure, we do make a first bracha. But we, it's very short. We don't make Birkat Amazon. And I answered the exact opposite. When should you really thank Hashem? Of course, when you're hungry, you should make a bracha. But it's when you're satisfied. And now you're not so hungry anymore. You don't feel that, that, that need, that drive anymore. You don't feel that humility anymore. 
you're satisfied, you're calm, you're tired now, you wouldn't mind kicking your shoes off, loosening your belt, having a bit of a shluf, and forgetting about God. No, that's the time you've got to thank God. You had a good meal, your, your, uh, your spirit is, uh, how should I say, um, in English, it's, uh, what is it? Lifted, you, 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 you're very satisfied with yourself and everything is nice and beautiful. That's the time. The most, that's the most vulnerable. That's when you have to thank Hashem. And not forget where everything came from. And therefore, all of those punishments are not punishments. It is really to weaken the negativity in the world. The forces of negativity in the world. The power of negativity, which comes from where? Ultimately, where does it come from? Ego. And when difficulties come upon a person, what ends up happening is, he becomes more humble. He's humbled. And when you're humble, your vessel is empty. It can contain godliness. But if you're full of yourself, there's no way that, uh, that godliness can enter. So all of these punishments in subsequent generations be it Noah, Enosh, Noah, etc., came to weaken the, the negativity that man brought into the world. On a Kabbalistic note, you are mamtiket adinim, from the Shoresh. What does that mean? It means to say that you sweeten the judgments, you sweeten the dinim, you sweeten the... the, uh, the, the um, the, the negativity of the world in its source. Where does negativity come from? How does it come about? Through concealment of godliness. If there was no concealment of godliness, we wouldn't have free choice. If we wouldn't have free choice, there wouldn't be any evil in the world, correct? Where does it come from? It comes from gvurot. Gvurot means severity or strength. That means to pull back. There's two, there's generally three, but let's split them into two. Generally two, two dimensions in the godly revelation. One is one of kindness and revelation. And one is of concealment and pulling back. And both are necessary. Without concealment and pulling back, there would not be a physical world. There would just be, remain spirituality. If godliness would just be revealed as it is, without any filters, there would only be godliness. Wouldn't be materialism. That filter is called gvura or dinim, judgments or severity, which is holding back, concealing. That, from that aspect comes the negativity or the possibility of negativity in the world. An ego and a sense of self, etc. in the world. Therefore, the punishments or the negative occurrences in the world are also rooted from there. They are harsh, harsh judgments. Like, for example, a person uh, uh, did, did a crime. So he's judged harshly. Why is he judged harshly? Uh, in our world, it's to punish and to also to, um, to um, um, discourage this type of behavior. Some would, someone who is a bit more noble would view that as paying his debt to society and a, a way of atonement and a way of rectifying the sin. But on a higher level, on a spiritual level, so, that, so that's judgment. The person is being judged in a criminal court, in a, in a court of law, with a judge or police or etc. You're being judged. The concept of judgment on the spiritual aspect, the spiritual dimension, is the holding back or the concealment of godliness. Concealment of bestowing God's good. Because not always we are deserving. Or sometimes if there's an abundance of good, then we don't appreciate it. There has to be a filter. Let me give you an example. A person is very thirsty. You take a bucket and you open the bucket on top of his mouth and you pour all the water. Correct? You're going to get all the water. You're going to get satisfied. You're going to get the water. You may even choke. So it's not beneficial. So there has to be a filtering. So you take a tap. And you place it in, you make a little hole, you place it in, and the water dribbles out a little bit, and then you take a cup, and you're able to drink. That's called vura. That's called the, the ability to filter, in order that the good will come in a manner that we can appreciate it, and handle it, 
and then grow from there. And then ultimately merit greater revelation a greater good. So the filtering which comes from the level of judgment is important, is necessary. But together with that also comes judging, judging the world. If we are God forbid not worthy. And therefore the concept of what's loosely translated as punishment is really a cleansing process by which to weaken it comes from the same source, right? So we're weakening the source from which the negativity was born from, so to speak. Makes a little bit of sense with me? In other words, should I explain a bit more? Okay. I know it's a... Okay. The way divine revelation works is generally speaking in two dimensions. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I want, I want to finish this today. The two dimensions, one of revelation and kindness. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. For example, I have emotions, I have thoughts, right? That's a revelation. But then there's speech. So speech, is it a revelation or a concealment? To you it's a revelation, but to me it's a concealment. Because I'm concealing more than what I'm revealing because, because I'm not revealing to you all of my thoughts. I can't. It's impossible for me to speak my thoughts. My thoughts are faster and deeper, and to articulate it, I have to think a lot, and it takes me a long time to think that one thought that I thought now. Especially if you study something at length, and you're just rethinking about it, it's, it's you basically in one thought, in one split second, you've conjured years of, of study, for example. And now I'm to explain that. So, so speech, on the one hand, is revealing to you, because that's the only mechanism and tool that I can connect to you. But it's more concealing. Do you understand? So we have revelation and we have concealment. Now, from this level of concealment, it's assumed as judgment. I'm judging now and discerning what word to, which words to use, how much to say, and what not to say to you. So I'm judging and I'm filtering. Do you understand? But together with that also comes judgment, whether you're deserving, whether you're fitting for me to teach you, whether you're fitting for me to reveal it to you, are you on that level, etc., etc., Together with that, if you're not behaving well, I'm in class or I'm your father, whatever the case may be, I have to decide whether I have to be able to discipline you as well. That comes from the same dimension. Do you understand what I'm saying? As opposed to showing you love and, 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 and encouragement and embracing you. I can't embrace you when, you when you're doing the wrong things. I have to be stern. I have to show you some level of sternness. If I don't, you just go on your life and I continue to tell you, yes, 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 yes. You'll get married and your wife tells you no. The world will be destroyed. Your world will be destroyed. I have to teach you how to cope with the yeses of the world and the noes of the world, the good of the world and the bad of the world. concept of reward and punishment is rooted in these two places as well. But it's not there as reward and punishment per se. It's to be able to bring to a higher, nobler goal, and that is the intrinsic essence of good that God implanted into the world. These are just the two-dimensional tools by which we get there. So therefore the punishments are really rectifying the, or reversing that which came from the same source, the filtering of godliness in the world, which ultimately was the cause that allowed me to sin in the first place. Or that put into place the ability, that created the ability and the potential to sin. I sinned, not God, but I, I was the one that erred. But the filtering, which came from the same source as punishment, the, that, the concealment, which allows me for a very important and necessary component of my existence and the purpose of existence, and that is free choice, comes from that level of filtering. Because if godliness is revealed, God's love is totally revealed, then I don't have free choice. And that's not true gift. That's not true love. There has to be the concealment. And thus there has to be the punishment as well. Not for the punishment's sake, oh, you did bad, I'm going to punish you. God doesn't need my action of good and bad. It's not for Him, it's for us. It's to be able to allow us to reach our potential. Just like the father reprimands the child and disciplines the child to allow him to reveal his potential and reach his potential. You with me on that? And therefore the punishment comes from the same realm. And therefore, if there is a punishment, it's because we've abused that mechanism or channel that put to place or allowed for free choice, which is concealment, comes from the same side. You know what I mean? So that's how it, it, 
it, it, it weakens that. It weakens the negativity that I brought to the world. The judgment that comes to the world weakens the negativity that came to the world or that I brought to the world in, through that mechanism of concealment. They both come from the same source and root. So one rectifies the other and allows for the goodness to reveal, to shine. Why does a father or a, or a, or a teacher reprimand and discipline the, the child or the disciple? In order to bring his inherent good out. Correct? And don't waste your time. You only have a short time in the class or in the world or to be my, or to be my, my disciple or to be my, my, my young child that I'm bringing you up in order to bring out the inherent good. So too, the punishment that came, came only in order to be able to allow for the world to reach its inherent good, not as a punishment, but rather to weaken the bad that we brought to the world. And then in order to be able to, for us to fix, to mend, to build. If a building is very, uh, it's got uh, foundations and no good, or it's got concrete cancer or whatever the case may be, or everything's falling apart, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do to the building? You're going to destroy it. The, the whole wall is no good. It's going to fall, collapse. What's going to do? If you don't rebuild this wall, the whole house could, could topple. That's a big threat and danger. Sometimes, sometimes we have to destroy in order to build. And that's the concept over here. And then came along a giant of spirituality. And he was Abraham Avinu. And from, his, from that point, the world began in a more organized and constructed manner to come to Tikkun, which was no longer destruction, of which there was a continuity of spirituality through Abraham and through his seed and generations to come until the giving of the Torah. Okay, so let's now move on from there. Ve'az kam Abraham Avinu, and then Abraham Avinu arose, shemimenu etchil binyan olam atikun, for which began the building of the world of tikun. I'm just going to throw this in. I, we don't have time to explain it. I'm just going to throw this in. There is call, there is in the spiritual rungs, or in the order of descent of which the Holy Ariza, the great Kabbalist, explains, there is a world called the world of Tohu, of chaos. Of chaos. It's a very sublime world of which the, the energy or the godly light is extremely powerful. The vessels weren't able to contain that spirituality, and so to speak, there's an expression called Shvirat Akelim, the breaking of the vessels. And that is the source, the spiritual source of negativity in the world. I don't want to speak about that besides just saying the world of Tikkun, which is the world of Atsilut, the world of Atsilut is called the world of Tikkun, the world of rectification, because in that world there was a harmony. Where there's peace and harmony, where there's unity, that's Tikkun. In the world of Tohu, the high world, there was no harmony between the, the differing levels. Each one was revealed its intrinsic core and could not relate to another dimension of revelation of godliness on a different plane. And thus there was a unhealthy, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, tension. But the, the world and the revelation was a sublime world, higher and even greater and preceding the world of rectification of Tikkun. And only then came the world of Tikkun, of harmony. And then later on, until this trickles down to this world. That's all I want to say. It, that, this in itself is a very lengthy uh, uh, concept and, and it needs a lot of explanation. But I just want to show you how we find that chaos in this world, the world began with chaos, if you think about it. Even in the Bible, if you have a look in the beginning of the Torah, it says, Bereshit barai lukim et hashamayim et in the beginning God created heaven and earth. 
Tov avo, the world was confounded and confused. It's a confused world. It's confounded. There it means that everything was created one, and then God divided the days, the nights, the but everything existed simultaneously. Just chaos. No structure, no form. So we see that chaos, in fact, proceeded in its spiritual source, proceeded tikkun or order and structure, proceeded tikkun, order and structure when God created the world, and also preceded order and structure and the birth of Abraham Avinu in the way that the world conducted itself with total chaos. So the fact that they could govern themselves and live total chaos, it has some spiritual impetus. It comes from somewhere. Even in spirituality, that there can be lack of order and structure. And that, in spiritual terms, is also called chaos. However high it may be, it's chaos. There's no proper harmony. It's not, you, can't, you, can't, you can't bear fruits. If you put ten different fruits in one, in one uh, ten different seeds in one uh, pot plant, it's just balagan. I never tried it, so I don't know what's going to happen. I can imagine that just things won't grow properly, just won't go. I don't know. It has to be structure and order. Abraham came to brought structure and order to the world. And so to all the tzaddikim that live beyond the material coarseness of the world and bring the world to its completeness and tikkun, goodness, spirituality, a weakening of our dependence upon materialism and the ability to see things from a different vantage point and perspective, more spiritual, to feel spirituality, is not a simple thing. But it can be done. I remember I told you the story, but it's worthwhile repeating here. When I studied to be a shohet, when I studied shahita, so you have to be able to feel on the knife, you have to feel with your fingernail, you have to feel the slightest of slightest of, of, of lack of smoothness. I'm not even talking about a bump that's absolutely not kosher because the knife has to cut so smoothly that the animal feels nothing. And when you say feel nothing, I mean absolutely feel nothing. One time I was uh, practicing to slaughter chickens and my friend quickly ran in with two chickens and he gave me, hey, grab the chicken, grab the chicken. He gave it to me with one wing like this and I barely had time to grab it. And the other wing banged the knife onto my finger and I cut my finger and I didn't even feel the cut. That's how sharp and smooth it is. It's a big, deep cut. I didn't feel the cut at all. It's on the blood I saw, but I didn't feel the cut at all. That's how smooth it is. I can tell you on my own flesh, didn't feel it, it's just you just place it on you, you don't feel the cut. That's how smooth it is. And so so you you part of the way to train is he teaches you how to sharpen and smoothen the knife. You use different types of stones, one to uh, sharpen and then slowly smoothen more and more. First of all, when you sharpen, you sharpen, you learn to sharpen with a rougher knife and then smoothen out more and more. And then you've got to bring him the knife to, for him to check to see that it's good and whatever. And you've got to check there's different ways of reflecting the light. You can see the light doesn't reflect smoothly. You know that, oh, there's something, something disturbing the reflection of the light. And then you feel it. So one time I prepared a knife and I gave it to him. And he says, oh, no, no, there's a lack of smoothness here. And I'm running my finger and as smooth as a baby's bottom. And he said, no, it's not smooth as a baby's bottom. Right over here. <laughs> Right away, can you feel it? I go, no, I don't feel anything. I don't feel anything. I thought the knife was smooth. And he holds his hand, my fingers, he puts his, my fingers on his, and he goes like that, and you feel, do you feel the vibration? And I go, no. <laughs> Just concentrate. So I close my eyes, concentrate, concentrate. Maybe I thought I did, but I did. <laughs> Maybe I pretended I did, but I thought I did. And that's how slowly it took me two weeks to sensitize my feeling. To, I thought, I, I'm never going to be a shahid. I'll never learn this. I thought, it's impossible. You've got to either have it or not have it. No, but I, I managed to sensitize my feeling and concentrate my feeling in all into my, my fingernail to be able to start feeling. So too with spirituality. 
we're able to sensitize ourselves to a degree where we focus our attention. I needed to focus my attention on my fingernail and to really, really feel. And then until I started to feel, then I could tell. I felt the most slightest of things that two weeks ago I couldn't feel. No way. So too with spirituality. You have to, we have to learn how to sensitize ourselves to begin to feel spirituality. But because we only feel or predominantly feel materialism, pleasures and desires, so talk to me about feeling spiritual, feeling love and fear, feeling unique and special or, or spiritual in our prayers or put on tefillin. It's like, what are you, which language are you talking about? I put on tefillin because I've got to put on tefillin, but I don't feel anything or I, do, I pray I don't feel anything. Or we can sensitize ourselves. But part, 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 part and parcel of that process is to be able to detach ourselves from the dependence of materialism because that makes us coarse. And then we're able to feel more. All right, let's quickly move along. And then the world slowly after Abraham Avinu, Yitzhak, Yaakov, the 12 tribes, and then again they had to go into an Egypt, this melting pot of, 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 of taking away their freedom, taking away their, their, their independence, almost like breaking them to humble them and prepare them to be the servants of God. Because you can't be a servant of God with the ego. That ego has to be broken. Lose the flavor of the materialism. When everything was going in, Israel, in, in, in Egypt good, they, uh, they, they began to forget the moral teachings and the values of Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov, what they brought with them from the land of Israel. And they began to live the lifestyles of the Egyptians, and they, you know, they went to the theaters, and they went to the this, and the culture, and the this, and the that. But they forgot the main thing that was so attracted to, and the world is very alluring and attracting, I'll be the first to admit. But there are much greater things. And they forgot those much greater things. There are much greater feelings. And they forgot those much greater feelings. And then they needed to be humbled again. Not as a punishment. But again, when there's more evil or more negativity, that has to be broken. And it's broken from the same attribute, from the same line, from the same direction. And that is severity or being judged, etc. Or being reprimanded, etc. Why would there be some preparation um, <clears throat> for judgment and whatever else on those who they're, they're good in Who may have been innocent. Okay, that's a, that's a shiur for itself. That's a shiur for itself. Because ultimately we all live in the same boat. If we're in the same boat and you make a hole, you're not making a hole just for you. It's the whole boat that comes in. But... We share a common, we share a common, a common, a common goal, and and it's very hard to answer that in a totally different topic in shiur. Um, we need to discuss that that separately. But certainly, certainly, until way after Abraham Avinu, uh, and even way further, the majority of the world was not like that. The majority of people weren't like that. It was a minority that followed monotheism, followed the teachings of Abraham, etc., etc. So, so that question doesn't even come to play till way later. That you can ask about the Holocaust, that you can ask about the Spanish Inquisition, that you can ask about the pogroms, where it was localized, not a world thing. If the world is being judged, then the world will be judged in accordance with a majority. But if a community is being judged, and maybe the majority is... Is, is, uh, is, is, is good, well there, there's a collectivity of the community at large that we share together uh, a role. And, and, and as I mentioned, and I'll try to hint a little bit, the concept of punishment is not necessarily such a bad thing as we view it, being punished, etc. It's trying to weaken the very root of the cause of negativity in the world in the first place. Okay, but I don't want to focus too much on that right now. Okay. And then came Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah. Where the world actually, through the giving of the Torah, the Jewish people reached the plateau of spirituality, that they were worthy of receiving the Torah, and the world came to its fruition. The world came to its tikkun. And 
And unfortunately, they sinned with the golden calf. Were they not to sin with the golden calf, then they would have remained on a very high spiritual level, a level prior to the sin of the golden calf. Uh, I beg your pardon, to the sin of the Garden of Eden. And pertaining to this, it says, This is what God said and in the creation initially when He said that He saw that everything was exceedingly good. We saw that the, the, the world was able to be worthy of the giving of the Torah. You know what the giving of the Torah is? Such a revelation that the world never saw before. It's an amazing revelation. Just let's finish this, otherwise we won't be able to, and we'll take some questions at the end. Because intrinsically, as we mentioned, the world has inherent good. And intrinsically, good has the ability to overpower bad. And that the world can reach a level and a state of all good. It is only the sin of the, of the tree of knowledge of good and bad that confounded the and, and, and confused good and bad, bad and good. It became difficult to make decisions. That's why we must le- turn to the Torah for authenticity of what good is, the definition of what good is. For if I will decide what good is, you will decide what good is tomorrow differently. And if it's subjective, then your good is not my good and my good is not your good. It's going to be a disaster. So there has to be a point of reference which is true and absolute and enduring. And that only can come from God. It can't come from any one of us. Because we are subjective. And we are um, like to uh, justify my actions and create a philosophy around what I truly desire and what I want. Okay. Now towards, afterwards, after the creation, at the completion of creation, what do we learn about the completion of creation? What happened to the completion of creation? Well, God created the world and, and uh, Shabbat. Shabbat. We learn about the Shabbat. In other words, that's the, the highlight of creation, Shabbat. For it is the day of rectification. All matters of harsh judgments and punishments. All of them leave and separate it from the world. All negativity, all judgments or harsh decrees all dissipate on Shabbat. And it becomes united with the good. Hagamur, with the total good. Like man before the sin. Shabbat has that spark of man before the sin. The revelation before man sinned. Someone who truly keeps Shabbat properly is able to tap in and able to grasp what man was before the sin. And when a person keeps Shabbat, the Gemara says, Mesech Shabbat, page 119, someone who keeps Shabbat, the Gemara lists many things, many rewards, so to speak, Shabbat. One of them is a person's forgiven for all of his sins. What's Shabbat got to do with sins? You want to tell me, keep Shabbat, you merit the world to come. Okay, I can relate to that. You want to keep, tell me, Keep Shabbat, you merit, whatever. Revelation, unification with God. I don't know. Tell me whatever you want. But why does the Gemara say, he who keeps Shabbat will be forgiven of his sins? What sins connected to Shabbat? Now we understand. Because the world has chaos. And chaos is a source of sin. But he who keeps Shabbat, which is the, 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 the day of rectification... And of unity, that makes sense now. Because that's the exact opposite of sin. It's unity. 
And therefore he keeps Shabbat, he's forgiven of his sins, because it is a day that transcends sin, transcends the sin of, uh, of, of the confusion that was brought about through the tree of knowledge of good and bad. You understand? That's the connection of Shabbat. And that's why the Gemara says, you're forgiven for all of your sins. So powerfully exacting everything that the sages tell us. They don't just pick something, they pick the reward. Um, let's take the hat, put a couple of good things in. Shammai, come on, come over here, it's your turn. Put a couple of good ideas in the hat. Um, uh, Abba, come over here. Abba Hilkia, come over here. Now you pick a couple of good things that we can put in the Talmud that will be a reward for... Now you put in the hat, put filin, Shabbat, mezuzah, tzitzit. All right, pull something out. Shabbat, beautiful, Shabbat. Pull your hat over here, pick something over here. Oh, forgiven of all of sins. Put them together, very nice. It's not just abstract ideas at random that they said, he who keeps Shabbat will merit to be forgiven of all of his sins, even sins of the generation of Enosh that made relegated God to abstract. No, everything's exact. Because it's, Shabbat is tikkun. It's man olam abba. The world to come is a world of rectification of which we will bring fruition and fulfillment and rectification. Shabbat is that concept. In fact, Shabbat, Shabbat as, a, as the word spells it's the same letters as Tashuv, return. Shabbat and Tashuv is the same thing. So it's not just random. <laughs> and that's why when Shabbat comes in, it's a revelation of godliness. And when there is a revelation of godliness, there's no room for sin. Of course, Total free choice is not suspended on Shabbat. But he who cares to can feel much lofty and greater on Shabbat than on the weekday. Now listen to what the Midrash says, a very interesting thing. Shepaga Adam Arishon Bekain. Adam Arishon, man, encountered his son Kain. Ve'amalo, man ase bedinach. What happened with your judgment? You killed Hevel. What happened? How did God judge you? He says, He says like this, Amalo, He says to him, Asiti tshuva, venit pasharati. I did tshuva, I repented. And I, uh, and we struck a compromise. In other words, I was forgiven, but He uses an interesting word, venit pasharati, and we compromised. Interesting word, compromise. I forgive you. All right, I'll compromise. Shelechur ein muban. I know many pasharti. Masha pasharai makadosh baruchu. What what's this concept of compromising with God? Achen abiur bazei al pi ma'amar maran asav kadisha melecha which al ma'amar katuv ayom el kain el Hashem hen gerashti oti ayom al panai pnei adama. And he explains as follows. He quotes from a book that he explains as follows. He explains for, for a great rabbi that explains as follows. When Cain was judged by God and he tells God, Hen adama, you have banished me from the face of the earth. And from your face, I've become hidden. In other words, godliness is hidden from me. And I am wandering. I'm a wanderer in the world. And he will find me, will kill me. What does it mean? Why will everyone find you, kill you? His argument was as follows. Since I am hidden from your face. In other words, godliness is now concealed from me because of this deep sin that I have done, that I have corrupted my soul through killing my brother Hevel. The ability to perceive spirituality has been taken from me. I'm unworthy of it. In other words, the, again, the more corrupt we become, the less we're able to feel. Notice the connection. Because I'm hidden from your face, I'm not able to feel and understand and perceive godliness. What is the consequence of that? Vaiti na vanad ba'aretz. I become a wanderer ba'aretz in the land. What does it mean ba'aretz? 
the physicality. In other words, I am now living a plane on the plane of... We can live on two planes. We can live on the spiritual plane and we can live on the physical plane. All of us live a little bit here, majority, maybe majority here and a little bit in between. What he's saying is because of my sin, I my face is hidden from you. And because it's hidden from you, I am now wondering, Ba'aretz, Ba'aretz means to say, in the materialism, I'm sunk in the, I'm trapped in the materialism of the world. I can't, I can't uh, release myself. How, how am I going to release myself from this problem? Gadol Avonim in so my sin is far beyond that I can handle. In other words, I'm stuck. It's like I'm in jail. I'm, what, he's, what he's telling God is I'm trapped. In a way, if we think about it, we trap ourselves in the materialism of the world. We become so dependent upon it, we're trapped. We've got to release ourselves. Otherwise, we're trapped by our pleasures, by our desires, by our wants, by our wins. We're trapped by my nature, the negative nature that we have. Don't trap yourself with that. Release it. Think how to improve. You're miserly, overcome it, because otherwise you're trapped by that stinginess of yours. You're angry, you're trapped by that anger of yours. You're indifferent, you're trapped by your indifference. You're indulgent, you're trapped by your indulgence. You're a slave to it. That's what he was saying, and that's an important lesson to us. I'm trapped. I'm trapped in the, in the artziut, in the materialism of the world. I'm now wondering, I'm no longer wandering in the heavens. I'm no longer traversing in the spiritual realms. I have been robbed, because of my own actions, of any spiritual perception. All I have now is I'm wandering in the physicality of the world, in the maze of, of materialism. That's all I got. Sad. But if we think it's... I, I feel like crying because it applies to me too. Well, I'm, I'm feeling what he's saying because I'm feeling it within myself. God, it's me too. And everyone will find me, will kill me. What does it mean, will kill me? It means to say, any challenge or any desire that will come my way, I don't feel that I can overcome it. And thus I'm bringing, so to speak, the concept of death to the world. Because what brought death to the world? The sin of eating of the tree of knowledge of good and, and bad. Therefore, every time I engage in bad, I'm simply... Enhancing and strengthening the bad, which is synonymous to death. And in Kabbalistic terms, any level that is lower is called death. In Kabbalah, that is our right, that, that a lower level is called death. And I'm not going to elaborate, I'm just, just showing you that he calls it death. It means to say, if it's lower, like a man, human being is upright. If his soul goes, what happens? Dies. He goes down a level. And then he's buried. The body's still there, whatever. He's got eyes, he's got a heart, whatever. Go down a level. Any descent is called in Kabbalah death. So therefore I brought death upon my... Every time I'm in the materialism of the world, I'm trapped. And then any pleasure or desire that comes my way, I'm trapped. I'm just enhancing the concept and the symbol what death represents. Darkness, concealment, division from godliness. Doesn't his own revelation and acceptance of that death will raise him up a little bit further because he's realizing oh. it? So that's tshuva, that's repentance. Listen to this. God gave him a sign. A sign. Says the Midrash. What sign did he give him? Shabbat. Ki ot hi beni u hu. Shabbat is called. Ki ot hi. It is a sign between me and you. He gave him a sign. There's very few things in the Torah called sign. One of them is Shabbat. The other one is Tefillin. Tefillin. Shabbat. Shabbat. So Tefillin is a sign. It's a sign. We place a sign upon our hands. Let it be a sign on your hand. Right? One of my ancestors wrote in his book, Menorat Maor, he wrote Shabbat is the acronym Shin Bet Taf. Shin Bet Taf, three words. Shabbat, the Shin is for Shabbat. Bimkom, in place of Tefillin. 
Shabbat is a sign, tefillin is a sign. Where there is Shabbat, you don't need tefillin. <laughs> Very nice. Where there is Shabbat, you don't need tefillin. Shabbat is a ot. It's a sign. Listen to this. Because through the Shabbat and the power of Shabbat, through that sign between me and you, you can go back to that spiritual perception. True, in the weekday it's going to be difficult. But you'll have Shabbat, every week you'll have Shabbat. I created Shabbat, I proclaim Shabbat holy. And because of that Shabbat, you will be able to then sense, desensitize yourself spiritually. From here we see that he's not lost, he's not totally, not all is lost. For he has the power of Shabbat. And this is the compromise that was given to him. So when he, when, when he, when he, Adam asked him, so what happened with you? He said, we came to a compromise. What's the compromise? Compromise is God is hidden from me. I said, God, how can I exist if you hide from me? I will be totally sunken in the, okay, you're right. It's Shabbat. Keep Shabbat properly. That's the compromise. You will then be able to re-enter, so to speak, the Garden of Eden. For Shabbat is me'ain olam haba. Shabbat is similar to the world to come. In as much as it, what's revealed on Shabbat, all of the weekdays together, put together, cannot compare. Shabbat is a very, very holy day. The Ben Shai writes that everything that is achieved on Shabbat is a thousand times more than on the weekday. A thousand, again, is not a, is not a number at random. He didn't just say, oh, a thousand, because it's a nice number. A thousand in Kabbalah is the most completeness that there is, because ten is complete. Each ten of the Sfirot, ten attributes, times ten, because they're all harmonious. That's a hundred. And then, and then ten within the hundred, ten times a hundred is a thousand. That's the greatest completeness that you can have. That's why it says, God's day is like a thousand years. It refers to a complete harmony, but... That's for another time. Now, even though that during the week they were earning a livelihood and we're so engrossed in the materialism of the world, we have to earn a living and we don't have that much time to spend on spirituality, Shabbat, we detach. No mobile phones, no work, spirituality. Prayer, reading of the Torah publicly, the whole parasha, the highlight, Rabbi Sermon. <laughs> I knew you'd like that one. <laughs> Kiddush. <laughs> yes, I know, I know, that's the highlight, I know, that's the real highlight, I know. Ach, ha Shabbat avuro ha-ot va-tikun she-hozer bo le Shabbat then allows... Cain and allows all humanity to be able to touch from the materialism and return to his source. In the Midrash there, it finishes the dialogue between Adam and Cain. And he says like this, Adam Arishon was striking his face. Oh my God, what have I done? What have I done? Because what happened? What happened when, say, when, he, when God confronted him and he said, did you eat from the apple? Me? It was my wife. She gave me. The wife that you gave me, she gave me. In other words, your fault. Didn't give it to him. Yeah, with her. He didn't do a complete tshuva straight away. It took him a while. <laughs> he, was, he, he mourned. Because this is the power of repentance and I did not know. I did not seize the opportunity immediately. He did Chuvah, I did later on. It says 130 years. He spent in Chuvah, 130 years. That's a very powerful number. I want you to remember that number because in a couple of weeks you'll have a shiur that has that number. Remember that number. Amad Adam Arishon. Adam Arishon stood up. The Amad and he composed a psalm. A famous psalm that we say on Shabbat. Mizmor Shir Leyoma Shabbat. Tov le'odot l'Hashem, a song of praise to Hashem, a song of, hang on, Leom HaShabbat, a song of, a mizmor, a, a composition of a song for the day of Shabbat, 
טוב להודות להשם. It is increasingly good to praise Hashem. He composed that song. What's the connection? Why did Adam Arishon compose that song? That poem? What's the connection? What's the connection to this story over here? Okay, so what happened? You did tshuva. Ah, you did tshuva? What a shame I didn't do tshuva. Hang on! I got a poem. It just entered my mind now. Mizmor, Shil, Yom Shabbat. I'm going to compose a song of Shabbat. What's the connection? The connection is the whole story. The whole story is that God gave me, I complain to Hashem, I'm going to be trapped in the materialism of the world. Give me, let me, pull me out. I'm going to give you Shabbat. Ah, Tao Shabbat. Remember, Shabbat is also connected to Tshuva, repentance, because we said Shabbat is the same letters as Tashuv, return. He composed that song. Now we understand the power of Tshuva, and all we else also understand the power of Shabbat, and how Shabbat has, gives us the ability and enables us for the rest of the week to overcome the materialism of the world and the sin of the tree of knowledge of good and bad, where good and bad is confounded and confused. There's much more clarity to be found on Shabbat if we devote ourselves to that day. It's up to us. It's not just a day of having a nice meal and having a, a longer shluf. It's a day that should also be devoted to spirituality and certainly not shlufing during the rabbi's sermon. <laughs> and um, so therefore this allows man to tap into the inherent goodness of the world, to derive strength for the rest of the weekday, and to be able to bring the world to its inherent good, and inherent completeness, tikkun, rectifying, fixing, complementing, and completing the world. We'll stop here. I had more um, to speak about this, but it could also be a different topic. So we'll stop here and we'll take some questions.